Look who's stopping by from the Senior Bowl right now, our friend from Sports yeah. Illustrated. Yes, you are in the uh, press box. I appreciate you finding wish, that spot, Albert. How are you? I wish I, I wish I could have given you guys a more scenic backdrop here, but this will have to do for <laughs> That's now. That's great. Nothing, no, seriously, uh, n- nothing says more lad peebles than that ceiling, I think. <laughs> Is that where you are? Is that no, the name no, of the... no, no. This is the new stadium. They got a brand new stadium. It's oh. actually a new stadium here. Yeah, like oh. University of South Alabama. Uh, fantastic, fantastic new facility. Um, and I gave you guys the view of like the uh, the back of the press box here. Oh, okay. I guess it's better than like the Coke machine over there. So. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, they're not sponsors, so we can't just show it. Uh, good to see Albert. What's the talk at the Senior Bowl about? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the quarterbacks are always the big one, you know, and so. Um, Obviously, Caleb Williams isn't here. Uh, Drake May isn't here. Uh, Jaden Daniels isn't here. Um, but like that second tier of quarterbacks have a chance to to make a move, you know. And so, so you know, I think the two big ones that people are watching are the two um, Pac-12 quarterbacks. I guess they would be Big Ten quarterbacks now, and, and Michael Penix and Bo Nix. And um, I think those two are sort of in a group with JJ McCarthy, who. You know, my understanding is like he was he, he sort of he wanted to come here, but he's a little nicked up from the season. And and, you know, obviously their season ran long. So but I think those three are sort of in the cluster behind the top three. And so one of the storylines here is going to be, does anybody make a big move? And then the other one, I mean, you know, normally by now, Rich, like in the old calendar, the hiring cycle is done. Um, and Washington still doesn't have a coach. Seattle still doesn't have a coach. The Chargers just hired their GM. And so um, there's a lot of that here, too, like where, you know, staffs aren't filled out yet. And the hiring cycle has been backed up to the point where, um, you know, there, there's more of those sorts of discussions going on here than there have been in the past. Because in the past, I think it always been a goal for teams that had openings to be able to bring their full staffs here. It's not the case anymore. Okay. So let's, uh, any, anybody still talking about the way conference championship Sunday went down? Anybody? Yeah. About that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I was, uh, I was just talking to a couple of people, um, with teams that, that, that played. And, uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the Niners to me, and I, you know, I was just talking to a couple of other guys about this, um, out there on the field, is the growth we've seen in them over the last two weeks. And, um, you know, like my, my perception of San Francisco has been that um, they have a great A game, right? Like they've got a great A game, um, like their fastball. But like, if they don't have their fastball, what do they have? And can they throw off speed? And, um, you know, I think where they've gotten in trouble the last few years is when you can take them off schedule, you can put them in long distance, you can make them play from behind. We saw it in that Ravens game in December. Um, and I think that's where we've seen real growth from the Niners, you know, um, the last couple of weeks is that like when everything wasn't right, they were able to summon something else. And, um, you know, it sounds funny because they've been good for a while now, like, you know, as a four NFC title games in the last five years. But, um, you know, I think you did see some growth there. And then, I mean, the other piece of it is like, I mean, my goodness, Patrick Mahomes, like the trajectory that he's on. Um, it's pretty crazy how he's been able to, lift a team that maybe isn't quite what the team he played on the last four years, five years were and get them to the, to, to, to the biggest stage in the sport. So um, what about the teams that, that didn't make the Super Bowl? What about the teams that lost, I guess is a better way to just quickly say it. Uh, anyone talking there about uh, Dan Campbell's yeah. decision-making Albert, anybody uh, from, yeah. uh, from, from and, and again, by the, I, I'm, I am looking for the grist of the mill because I'm sure I'm wondering if there's others from other cool. organizations that are like, absolutely, these are the right decisions. We know all about analytics and others like saying, yeah. what the hell is he doing? I, I want to, I'll get to that too. But like, I do think one thing that's sort of interesting about it is like what Dan Campbell said at the end of the game, like where it was like very honest, like this could be our only shot. And then you see like both his coordinators are interviewing with the commanders. And then you look at the Ravens and Mike McDonald is interviewing with the Seahawks. And, um, you know, so there's definitely that piece of it, like where it's like both those teams had great opportunities and those aren't there anymore. As for Detroit specifically, um, you know, when we're talking about the decision-making a lot of football people don't agree with what Dean Campbell did. I mean, I'm just going to call it what it is. You know, like if you talk to people who've been in the game for 20, 25 years, the coaches, the scouts, um, you know, what they'll tell you about this sort of decision-making and, and look, like, I think there is, you know, obviously analytics plays into it and everything else, but you know, like there's also the situational awareness here, you know, and 
Um, if you turn a 24 to 10 game into a 27 to 10 game, does San Francisco have to play that differently, you know? And obviously at the end, if you kick the field goal and tie it now, the whole last four or five minutes of that game has a different context. So I, that's more of what it is. It's just the way situational football is being handled is evolving. And, um, you know, obviously analytics plays into that, but there's definitely pushback into the way from, from football people um, on the way that the Lions handled the end of that game. What about any, are there any analytics folks at the senior bowl or this? I mean, sure. And they, I mean, I, I found like talking to some of those people, like they're defensive, you know, like, of like, no, this is the right thing to do. My bigger question, Rich. So, like I, I thought about this a lot the last couple of days, right? So you're in fourth and three, okay? And then you look at the numbers and the raw numbers tell, give you a certain success rate, right? Well, tell me how many of those situations Patrick Mahomes was the quarterback or Tom Brady was the quarterback, you know? Are those numbers that you're that they're spitting out at us on the broadcast? Is it, okay, like, well, teams are this successful in fourth and three, but most of the teams that are in fourth and that are going for it in that situation have elite quarterbacks. So does that skew it? What are the conditions of the game? What's the score? Like, and that's the thing. I think, like, that's the thing, like, that Belichick has always been, was always so good at, right? It was mixing, like, probability with feel. And I think that there's a middle ground there, right? Like, the famous story from, was it Super Bowl 49, right? The Seahawks game where Bill looked over at the other sideline and said, it just doesn't look right over there. I'm going to let the clock run. I'm going to force them to make the decision here, you know? So, I think it's almost like a it's an argument between art and science. And I think that there's somewhere there's 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 some interesting answers in the middle of there, but I do think to some degree, like the art side of it, which is like the old school football side of it and the science part of it, um, which is the analytic side of it, like it's almost like they've sort of retreated to their corners. And that middle ground, I think, is where the real answer is, right? You can use the analytics as guardrails. Like that was, I remember, you know, Eric DaCosta, the Ravens general manager, using that term with me, you know, six, seven years ago when I did a story in analytics, like they're guardrail, use them as guardrails, not as absolutes, you know? And I think it's like this, but I think what it's become now is like, on one side, you get the football people with the art of those decisions. And on the other side, you've got the analytics people with the science of those decisions. And unfortunately, too often, those two sides retreat to their corners and don't seek out the middle ground where I think the right answer probably is. Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen Show from the Senior Bowl. You were at the AFC Championship game. What would you see? And the reason why uh, uh, the Chiefs might have had the advantage over the Ravens after all, other than Mahomes, couple, clearly. Yeah. I mean, well, let's we'll start with Mahomes because I do think like that's a huge part of it, you know. Sure. Um, your ability to throw the ball deep on third and nine in that situation to drive the dagger into the home team is something that not every team has. And, you know, I talked to Matt Nagy after the game about that. That's something they came up with the Saturday night before. And it was something they had confidence in and they held on to and they went to when it was when it mattered most. Right. Um, but what really struck me talking to Nagy and to Andy Reid after the game about it was just as important were like the plays in the middle of the game where Mahomes didn't do something stupid. And we always look at him as like this just wild, like wild Bronco playmaker. You know what I mean? Like he's all over. You, you just make anything out there happen. But sometimes people ignore, like he took a sack late in that game where that kept the clock running and it cost the chiefs like two yards, but it was the right decision. It's like the situational awareness. It's not just like that. He's got the ability to, it's not just the ability to put on the Cape and be Superman it's the ability to know when to do it and then when to just cut your losses or do something sensible or check the ball down. It's that what's like, it's that like that I think is separating Mahomes from everybody else now. Um, so there's that part of it. And then the defense, I mean, Steve Spagnuolo said to me after the game, this is the smart, this is the deepest well of smart players I've ever had in my career, like all my years coaching in the NFL. And he said like most teams have, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, some dumbass who's you got to worry about, who's always doing something stupid. And like, we don't have any of those, like we don't have to worry about any of our guys out there. They're always going to do the right thing. And um, the way that they were able to really, I think, frustrate Lamar and shut down that running game and force the Ravens to play the game on their terms. 
I think Steve, Steve Spagnuolo has done a fabulous, fabulous job with that defense. And um, it's made it so that structure of the team's a little bit different, which again, plays into Mahomes' awareness of knowing how he has to win now and knowing that there's a different way to win than maybe how he won four or five years ago. How come Spagnolo's not on people's lists? Because he's 64 years old and he coaches defense. I mean, I think that that's really it, you know, like he's a, I mean, I, I think if he was an offensive coach and you had the same resume, he'd probably get another shot, you know, probably would have gotten another shot. Um, I mean, I, the most remarkable thing about it, I was, you know, I was with Trent McDuffie after the game and he told me this story about how Spags helped him get through an injury last year. And, um, you know, McDuffie had such clean coming out of Washington had such clean medicals. So he never really had this sort of injury that was taking him out for an extended period of time. And, um, like he said, like Spags helped him through that. And then when it came time, it's like, I trust you. I'm putting you back out there. You're going to play every snap now when he was healthy enough to be cleared. And um, McDuffie said he would do anything for Spags, right? Because he knew it wasn't just trying to win a game. It was like he had Trent's best interests at heart. And you see the t-shirts in the locker room. I'm sure you saw them. The in Spags We Trust t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. yeah it's like Spags has got like the leadership piece of it too. You know, like, and it's not just he's like a genius with maybe one of the best big game defensive coordinators we've ever seen going back to the Super Bowl against the Patriots with the Giants. Right. But he also like has such engagement and such investment from his players. And that's sort of like what Dan Campbell has in Detroit, you know. So I think if we were talking about a younger coach who wasn't a defensive coach, we'd be looking at Spags and saying, yeah, like it's all there. But unfortunately, the market for older coaches on that side of the ball just isn't what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Mm. I, again, I just think like Andy Reid is like Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's like, these and this is not the coach you're looking for. And all of a sudden, oh, that's right. It's not the coach I'm looking for. And suddenly he keeps his entire staff pretty much with the exception of Nagy, who's now back because it didn't work out with Trubisky, although the one year it did, he was coach of the year. And uh, the enemy is, um, I'm assuming, going to stay with the Washington staff? Or I don't, we'll see. I mean, I don't yeah, know. we'll uh, see. I mean, nobody I think knows. it's sort of... The- it depends what the committee, what happens with the commanders. I mean, I, my sense was they went into this week really open-minded, you know, Adam Peters and, um, you know, Josh Harris. Like I, the, the sense I've gotten was that where everybody thought like the Ben Johnson things have faded complete, he could still absolutely be the coach there. Um, I, I, it felt to me like they, they almost wanted to take the approach that they were launching their coaching search this week because they were getting the chance to sit down with these guys and really dig in with these guys. And it was almost like they wanted to start anew this week. Again, that might mean you land on Ben Johnson, but I don't think that they were in this spot where it was like a fait accompli who they were going to pick. So it's hard to say when that's the case, like whether or not an individual assistant like Eric the is going to survive. Okay. And then, you know, you said earlier how Spagnolo took the run game away what about the sense that the Ravens took their own run game away? Uh, Todd Monken's um, play mm-hmm. calling. Um, and again, you were there. You were seeing what the Chiefs yeah. were doing. It, it just was weird. It it, it was one so, of their. It was one of the worst Ravens days we've seen all year, if not the worst Raven mm-hmm. day. You know. Like, so um, I think it was a game plan thing, though. You know, like I think it was. I think it was Spags getting in. Like coaches can get in each other's heads, right? And I think Spags to some degree got in Todd Monken's head, you know, like, and early on they were mixing some of the rush stuff they were doing. And with the way Spags explained it to me was like, there was an adjustment they made late in the game to get even more aggressive. And it was because when they rushed with four, it was okay. Like Lamar is going to find an opening and squirt out. And that was happening to them a little bit more early in the second half. So it's like, we're going to disguise what we're doing still, but we're going to send more and we're going to clog every running lane. And I mean, it was almost like, like run blitzes, you know? So they were daring the Ravens to beat them throwing the ball and the Ravens couldn't do it. You know? I mean, I think that's sort of what it came down to the way that the chiefs were playing. That was, you're going to have to beat us through the air. And um, you know, in the end, like maybe the biggest difference was like, that pick, you know, in the end zone that um, I think it was Deion Bush put, picked it off in the end zone for the chiefs. Um, I know like their defensive players felt like we have them now. Like that was where they were like, we've got him because that was a frustration throw. And, um, you know, I think it's again, a, a great credit to the, the, the IQ of the players that they have out there that they were able to adjust in game and play like a different game late. And then, you know, a credit to Spagnolo, of course, for everything we've already talked about. 
Albert Bray here. A few minutes left with uh, with him from Sports Illustrated, the senior reporter and scribe of MMQB Must Read every single week right here on the Rich Eisen Show. So what's the world of Bill Belichick right now? And does anybody know it? I mean, what, what do we what do we have with him? So, yeah, I, like I think Arthur Blank wanted to hire Bill the coach. I think the problem was, and we talked about this last week, I believe, right? Like, was that like everything else? It was, do I want to blow up my organization? And there were other people, you know, warning Blank about this and in his ear about this. Do I want to completely turn my operation upside down and make this a Patriot-like operation for what could only be two or three years? Now, I'd argue it's the greatest coach of all time. You should probably do it. You know what I mean? But, but it's a lot. And so I think that that sort of sets up as Bill's problem going forward is, you know, is there somebody, and I remember doing, you know, television producer I work with in New England asked me in the middle of the season, like, hey, go like ask around about Bill's market and find out what it was. And um, so I asked around and it wasn't, the answer I got wasn't what I thought I'd get, which was, is somebody willing to come in and have him in like the Bill Parcells in Miami role, where it's like the overseer, Tom Coughlin in Jacksonville the second time around, somebody probably hire him to do that. Will somebody hire him to coach? Absolutely. Somebody will hire him to just be the coach. But will somebody throw him the keys the way Robert Kraft threw him the keys in 2000? And the answer to that really has been no. You know, And I think that that's, that's sort of what I think Bill will be facing going forward because I do think he still wants to coach. So if he doesn't get one this year and it looks like he's not going to get one this year, then going into the 2025 hiring cycle, is he willing to do something that looks different than – the way it was set up in new England. And can he present an owner with a plan where it's like, yeah, I may only be here for two or three years, but here's the guy that I'm going to hand it off to. Here's why it's going to work 10 years from now. Here's why you're not just buying into this for the next 24 months. I think that's the challenge for bill now. And, you know, going in and it sounds freaking insane. Doesn't it like Trump, bill Belichick trying to get a job in 2025, you know? Right, but I mean, he, he's gonna, I imagine, stay in football some way, shape, or form. Yeah, maybe he'll be year. sitting next to you. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I nobody you knows. Guys had a pretty good rapport, no, right? Not, well, I, honestly, <laughs> he, he I, I saw firsthand how great at the gig yeah. he he would be and can be. So I just don't know. And then, um, and then why wouldn't anybody want to go and knock on his door? I, I was kind of surprised that uh, he did not get a job in this cycle, Albert. I mean, you know? I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if you see him like in the spring as like an assistant lacrosse coach at Wesleyan. <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, you know I don't know. I mean? Like right. Like, uh, I mean, I, I like like honestly like I think I do think that there's like probably part like, of it for him. Are, are you saying like do- was that your way of saying he'd be his daughter's assistant? Is that what you're saying? Albert? Yeah, well, I think she's at Holy Cross. Holy now, Cross, right? okay, so, that's where she is. Yeah, right. I mean, like, but it would be an opportunity for him. To, I mean, like, I just think he loves coaching, you know. And I, I, to the very end, Rich, to the very end in New England, the people I've talked to there, he's they said he did the job until the very, you know, the story about Nick Saban. What was it? Nick Saban was like interviewing receivers coaches the morning he retired right right it was like it was like that like bill was doing the job like that up until the very end i saw it and, i saw it yeah. i was there for for his last win i called his last win i i did a, i had a production meeting with him yeah he, he, he just it was the same as any other meeting i've ever had with him yeah for that sort of thing yeah. and so i think he's i think he i think he wants to coach again yeah. i think the school record does matter to him um and i honestly like I think the failure of guys like Bill Belichick and Mike Vrabel to get jobs is eye-opening. And I think it does speak to something in the league right now where it's, I think like the atmosphere, like owners want to like coming to work. And I think that's sort of an overrated thing. Um, But owners like the idea of, Hey, like let's have like an uplifting environment and all that. Like, and football is a tough game. You know, and there are guys who coach it in an old school way, and it does work if you can package it a certain way and sell it to players and have the right people around you. Um, but I see fewer, I feel like fewer owners are willing to go into, go in on something that they could, they perceive as old school than maybe you would have seen even three or four years ago. And I think that that's part of the reason why Vrabel was out in Tennessee, to be honest with you. I think Vrabel is one of the seven or eight best head coaches in football, but like, I think part of it was like, 
Amy Adams Strong didn't like coming into work. And like when the owner doesn't like coming into work, like that can create a problem. <laughs> yes, it can. This yeah. just in. This just in very keen uh, reporting sense right there. And, <laughs> and, and while, while you're on it, just like just because just to circle back to what you said before, that J.J. McCarthy wanted to be there, but you said his season lasted long. Can you find out for me how how it how long it lasted? Yeah. Can you there are can lots you, of ugly helmets out there? Can I you saw, get on that but for there, me, but please? There were, there were more blue helmets than silver helmets because all the silver helmets are still in Columbus. That's right. I mean, yeah. then I yell money is that spigots on. That's for sure. See, I know. I know. That's how I know we're back. Rich is when you when you start accuse Ohio State of paying players again, even though it's legal now. Is I, that's when I know oh, we're back. Albert. Albert, you don't really, I mean, that's why they're back, Albert. A lot of those kids could go to the pros and be very, very it's good. In tw- no, I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm not saying it's illegal. I'm not saying it's illegal at all. You guys should try it. Try no. paying your players. Hey, it's the collective. So yeah. it's, it's, it's the spigot is on. So it, uh, it's it, the foundation and the 1870 society. They're doing great work. Okay. Very good. I'm sorry. Shout I don't out. mean, I don't just give it all a shout out. Very good. Uh, Albert, thanks for the time. Enjoy Alabama. Right. We'll chat again. That's uh, Albert right, thanks, Albert Breer here on the Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 